<clears throat> the obvious point is to start off what defining what value and uh, what, what value is and what a value trap is. So uh, everyone knows the term value. Uh, it tends to imply you're buying something for uh, less than it's worth. Value trap is is obviously you thought it was worth more, but it wasn't. The, so rather than uh, jumping into very bland definitions, let me show you a real world uh, example. Both of these stocks uh, listed around about uh, well. They, they listed around about the same place. I decided to take this back uh, from 2008. Um, and you can see both of them started quite high. Um, orange is company S, uh, green is company P. This is a perfect demonstration of, of crashing share prices. Now, yes, the credit crisis uh, knocked in here and the entire stock market fell. But you can see both of them are collapsing ter uh, terrifically right down. And over this entire period there, what you have is you have both of these companies, and company S and company P, both traded below their net asset value, and in fact, their tangible net asset value. Now, a net asset value is nothing more than if you were to liquidate the company, that's theoretically how much its balance sheet is worth. Um, so quite, it's, not a, it's not even about earnings, it's actually simply the, the core underlying assets of the business. Tangible uh, net asset value strips out the intangibles. So it's stripping out things like goodwill and software and questionable stuff that arguably if you liquidate the business is actually worth this. So it's hard assets that you could touch and feel, cash in the bank, plant property and equipment and the like. So during this entire period where these shares, uh, company, uh, shares of company S and company P are, are falling all the way, they were trading below their tangible net asset value. Now, that tends to be a sign that a company is undervalued. But as we can see, company S... Um, and play forward has gone into liquidation. Uh, company P has, well, you would have made basically a 10 bagger there. You would have made about a thousand percent, um, incredibly in the profit. Now, both of them, both of them have, have a similar, uh, you know, you can see the share price history is the same. They're both traded below tangible nav, but they have very marked differences. Company S is what we call a value trap. If you had bought it below tangible net asset value, um, well, you, you probably would have lost your money despite that. Company S, you would have made tons and tons of money. That's the difference between value and the value trap. So um, we're going we're gonna to basically analyze both company S and company P. I always believe practical examples are much more valuable than, than talking hypothetically. So, and, and at the end of the presentation, we will uh, have a look, and I'm sure you guys have all very good, uh, uh, very good or strong suspicion of which company is which, but we'll, we'll then reveal that and show how in retrospect, now the problem is in genius, we're all geniuses in retrospect. Um, but it, I'm hopefully by doing this demonstration, this practical example, I'm giving you some tools that you can start to apply to other scenarios where share prices have crashed and companies are trading below tangible nav or nav or just look like they might hold value, that you can start to apply to them. So what is the real difference between these stocks? Now, go back to this. If you were a technical analyst, um, you know, who knows what you could have told from this graph. I'm not a technical uh, analyst, but more importantly, um, when, you, when you're analyzing value versus value trap, it's not a question of share price. It's actually a question of value. It's a question of valuing the business, looking at the b uh, bankruptcy risk. These are fundamentals. So when looking at uh, or comparing value versus value traps uh, in companies, your toolkit is not technical uh, analysis. Your toolkit that you want to use is fundamental analysis. And I always break down fundamental analysis into four, I call it my four pillars. Uh, profitability, which uh, profits are really the aim of a business. Liquidity, you know, cash is king. You want uh, the more, the better. Uh, solvency is really a question of debt versus risk. Uh, management, well, businesses don't make don't make things happen in isolation. They have management that guide them, and particularly in companies that are, that are crashing, you're actually often looking at what we call a turnaround. So you need strong management in place, and this is probably one of the most important criteria and it's the most opaque and obtuse to, to, to try to decipher. There is a fifth one, though, that I'm going to add for the purposes of this discussion. Companies don't operate in isolation. They operate within industries, and sometimes entire industries are simply not worth investing in. 
And, and if, particularly if this is a marginal player in a contracting industry and it's ladled with debt and all sorts of problems, the odds are it won't survive because it's a contracting in industry. Marginal players get squeezed out. So you have to look at macro factors too. Um, these five metrics, we're going to run through them uh, fa fairly quickly versus company S versus company P. So company S, we're having a look at profitability. Now, uh, there's, there's a reason I like gross margin. Before I even look at this, uh, when, when, you, when you're analyzing particularly uh, turnarounds, gross margin is very important. Let me phrase it this way. If you have strong competitive advantages, so strong competitive advantages in be it in uh, a service or a product, you can charge more than it costs you to make that, let's say, product. In other words, you'll tend to have a very high uh, uh, GP margin, gross profit margin. GP margins are reflective of competitiveness. Operating profits, or operating profit margin is reflective of the efficiency you run your business. Basically, once you've sold your products and you've made your gross profit, how efficiently are you running your overheads? So uh, operating profit margin often tends to be a question about scale. Gross profit margin is actually a question about competitiveness, and that's how you tend to separate the two. Your starting point is actually gross profit margin. If you don't have a strong gross profit margin, you often don't have a very good value proposition to your customers, and you, you probably have a lot of competition and a lot of substitute goods and the like where they can go. That risks your business. That risks this being a value trap. Company S's gross, gross uh, margin is 15%. Now, is that high? Is that low? Best look at it versus the industry. Here we're comparing the two companies, though. Um, and you can see company P's gross margin is a whopping 58%. Company P, by the way, is, is uh, it, uh, what we call RP rich. It's rich with intellectual property. So its cost back, back ages ago is an established uh, uh, R&D. It spent a lot of money developing products that were unique to its competitors. Company S, though, obviously didn't. Uh, so company P looks more attractive on that basis. Let's, let's drop down to operating margin. Remember I said gross profit margin is competitiveness. Operating profit margin is efficiency of the business. The operating profit margin for company S last reported one is 7.3 versus 3.2 in company P. Now it makes company P look inefficient. But, but bear in mind, these over these, you're looking at the slightly longer term, uh, time frames and you start to play with averages. Uh, the average, excluding one year loss, the average in company P operating profit margin jumps up to 9%. Basically, you, you, you've got a bit of an outlier year that's dragged down the average. Um, company, company S, though, unfortunately has the opposite. It has a declining operating profit margin. If you look at uh, the trend, you're looking at trends, you're looking at averages, and you're looking at absolutes and relatives. But here, company S uh, is actually getting less profitable. And we can see that when you have a look at the ROE, the return on, uh, return on equity. First of all, it's 5% for company S, which is below the cost of equity. Cost of equity, let's take it as a rule of thumb for a small and mid-capsule and JSC, is roughly 15%. That means for the amount of risk you take running the business, you have to earn 15% of my money. Or else you're not justifying the risk. And I'd rather put my money into less, uh, less risky things with better risk-adjusted returns. So, and this is, uh, and this is actually a good example or, or a symptom of why companies' the shares tend to trade below net asset value. It's because, of, because the net asset value, the equity of a company is not being applied profitably. So hence the market marks it below that. But um, much more importantly than its uh, very small return on equity, company S, its trend is once again for a declining return on equity. It's getting worse over time. To couple that with low profitability and declining return on equity, as opposed, uh, have a look at company S. Its return on equity is 8.4. Um, its, its return on equity has been fairly volatile um, and is, is currently a bit below mean at this point. There is no clear trend, but the average is, is, is reasonable. Um, and you'll see for, uh, what's also interesting is because the trend is towards well, the high gross profit margin, and in fact, company P is currently has a trading statement out. And this, this is uh, too much information for the analysis, but the trend going forward, company P is turning around. Its profitability is going up as opposed to company S profitability going down. So in conclusion, company P beats company S on most measures. It appears more profitable and probably more important than more profitable. 
it's moving in the right direction. It's getting not, it's not just more profitable, it's getting more profitable. So that's profitability. Then I mentioned liquidity. Liquidity cash is king. Now, company S, uh, now these are actually quite, quite different sized companies, the market cap wise and the like. So when I throw out the number where uh, I, I say they've got 29 million cash on the balance sheet and the like, versus 12 million. 29 million looks a hell of a lot better than uh, 12 million, but sometimes you actually have to look at it on, uh, versus the size of the company. Let's start at the top there. Cash generated per share is negative three out of the last six years in company S. It's about a 50% miss rate. Um, it, 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 you can start to look at working capital, the current ratios and the quick ratios. Now these tend to, uh, I'm not going to go into too much technical detail around the ratios. Often your stock brokers will publish these. You can find these on various uh, sites. But you want these ratios as high as possible. They are taking your liquid assets and dividing them by your liquid liabilities. So in other words, you want as many as possible liquid assets and as few as possible uh, liquid liabilities or current liabilities. Um, in other words, you want these ratios as high as possible. So first, more importantly, uh, Company S, yes, their current and quick ratios are above one. They have more liquid assets than they have liabilities, current liabilities. But compare that to the Company P, its current ratios and uh, its current and quick ratios is, is much, much, much higher than uh, S. In fact, it's double and triple. Um, and you have a look in the cash generated per share, it's had a miss rate of only 25%. Three out of the last uh, five years, it's made cash. And cash, remember, liquidity cash is king. Uh, uh, um, back in a past life, I used to have an audit partner, and she said, if there's more money coming into the bank account than there is going out, I, it doesn't matter what your accounting profit is. You are still in business. And that's, that's where the cash generated per share is quite important. Then, like I said, have a look at the cash balance on, on, on the balance sheet. Uh, 29 million looks more than 12 million, but that 29 million is only 4% of the equity of company S, whereas uh, the, in company P, that 12 million is actually a whopping 37% of equity. So company P already looks better capitalized. Um, once again, company P looks better on most measures, more liquidity and cash generation on an absolute and a relative measure. So it's, it's versus itself, it's versus uh, a company S and it's on its own. The more cash you have, the more liquid you are, the higher the odds are you can turn this company around. Then we have solvency. Solvency is a big word for debt. How much debt do you have? Now, debt is a ticking time bomb. The longer you leave debt, that's, well, the more you have to pay. That's what interest is. And especially when you're turning around the company, you tend to have quite a narrow time frame. So the more debt you have, the greater the risk is that your time frame is too short. Where if you had 100 years, you could turn the company around at your leisure, but you have a massive amount of debt and maybe you actually only have, uh, you know, a year or two. Um, I was talking to, talking to a CEO the other day who they were a couple of years ago, three days away from bankruptcy. And that was with debt. They needed to service that debt. If they defaulted on that debt, they could have been liquidated. They were three days away. And that's what debt is. It's a ticking time bomb. So especially in singling out value versus value trap and, and in working out if the turnaround has, has a probability of success, compare the debt. Debt is often a very important one, cash and debt. Uh, now, company S, debt of 160 million versus company P, debt of only 2 million. Once again, you, what does that really mean? You have to view that in the context of the company. So we use a ratio called debt to equity. It's quite simple. It's debt divided by equity. Uh, company S, debt equity ratio of 0.2. A company P, debt equity ratio of 0.1. So you've got more equity um, versus your debt. And so company P looks relatively uh, less geared uh, than company uh, S. But I need to emphasize a debt to equity ratio of, of 0.1 and 0.2 is actually fairly low. Preferably, you don't want any debt in a turnaround company. But these ratios are actually moderately geared and they're not, they're not shocking ratios at all. What we also do is we call it – we call and uh, there, there's a thing we call the net debt to equity ratio. Now, notice on the previous slide, we're looking at liquidity, uh, where we particularly look at the cash balance. Now, company S has a really, really nasty overdraft of 81 million. 
In fact, that 29 cash, if you take out the 81 million, not only do they not have cash, they're in net overdraft position. So what you tend to do in the net equity, uh, net debt to equity ratio is you actually take the cash on the balance sheet out of the debt. Assume the company has settled their debt and paid all the debt for the money they have right now. How much debt is left? Company S, their debt to equity ratio actually goes up because they're in a net overdraft position. Now, overdraft is incredibly scary. It's payable on demand. They can phone on Christmas Day and say, hey, we want, to, we want you to pay their overdraft. And if you can't, we're going to – we, we uh, often see debtors to it or this or that. They theoretically could liquidate the company in a net overdraft position. Not that they often do, but that risk is real. It, it is there. So, in fact, company S, net, de net debt equity ratio is worse than, 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 than even its debt to equity ratio. As opposed to company P, notice what happens to its net, de uh, net debt equity ratio. It goes negative. They've actually got more cash than they have debt. If they were to settle their debt right now, well, at, at that reporting date, they would, their debt would be extinguished and they'd be left with cash on the balance sheet. That's a very comfortable position to be in, sitting in a net cash position. Once again, company P better on all measures. Uh, the less debt in the turnaround, the less time pressure you have, um, and the lower risk the turnaround is. Company P is ungeared. It, it simply looks preferable to company S in this position. Then we have management. Now, I contemplated how to put this slide together without uh, the threat of a lawsuit. Um, and at the start, I'll stick, I'll stick to factual points. Um, no one can debate factual points. So let me, let me phrase it this way. Company S, uh, it was listed during, during boom times on the Alta X. Most of its founding managers uh, uh, left. They sold their stakes. They left. They don't even manage the business anymore. There's outside people managing it. Um, company P, it also listed, maybe a little later than company S, uh, but basically during boom times, its founding shareholders are still invested, still manage it day to day, and in fact have been buying stock in the open market recently. An absolute difference, like a, a dramatic difference between the incentive, motivation, uh, retention of management in these. And uh, as they say, rats are always the first to jump ship. Uh, company P's directors, and also remember I said company P, and you can see that by the gross margin, they're RP rich. They have massive competitive advantages at a product and service level. They can charge a lot more for their product than anybody else can because they can't be replicated. Um, now, that's why it's very important that they lecture their directors, their founding shareholders, and their directors are still managed day to day, are still invested and are still there because they have the know-how. Whereas company S it doesn't have the gross, uh, gross profit margin, maybe it's not that competitive, but more importantly, the know-how is left out the door. Yes, you can buy new know-how, but there's still the learning curve, understanding a new business and everything. So hence, company P's management, just basically on these factual points, appear to have better odds and actually better incentives because they're personally invested in turning around company P. Finally, the macro factors. Uh, and when the company S is in the construction sector, company P is in the telecommunications, equipment, and hardware sector. Um, this, now, we all know the, the, that over the last couple of years, uh, the construction sector has had overcapacity, uh, post-World Cup hangover. There's incredible competition because of overcapacity. There's margin pressure. Uh, there's not spending. The infrastructure rollout is not happening as promised. Uh, these, these guys are really struggling. And you could see that. You could see that in the index graph where the uh, construction, the entire construction index has sunk horribly over the same time, the time frame that company S's share price has sunk. Um, so if even the big guys are struggling here, the marginal guys uh, almost don't have a chance. Uh, whereas as a per, you know, compare that to company P operating in the telecommunications sector, now the, the telecom sector are is quite competitive. There is deflationary pricing in it. Uh, there is uh, new guys rocking up. There are big deals happening. You know, MTN's trying to go into Africa. Um, data, data prices are dropping the whole time. We've got a massive saturation of, of mobile phones in South Africa, landline, landline to mobile substitution. 
uh, you know, automobile to landline substitution. Uh, so there's a lot of com- uh, competitive pressure, but it is a highly cash generative, um, very dynamic market. What is more important is that the company P does not operate in the telecommunication sector. It supplies them. The more the more competition that happens in, in the telcos, the more they have to roll out infrastructure and the more they, the greater the greater the number of players, the more potential customers you have as, uh, as a company selling, supplying into the telco sector. Company P also sells into the defense market, but I couldn't find the index for that one. Um, but so you can see a marked difference. Whereas what I have done is, uh, is I've normalized both of these uh, indices um, to 100. And you can see there's uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the Tolco's index has gone up 40%, whereas, uh, whereas the uh, construction index has dropped 40%. That is, a, that is a swing of 80% between the two different indices. Massive, massive fundamental differences in the macroeconomic environments that both of these companies are operating in, or they're respectively operating in. So, in summary, company, w- would you agree with me if I said company P uh, appears a value trap, and that is not just using the hindsight of looking at the fact that it's actually currently in liquidation uh, and the share price crashed and never recovered, but it's got low GP and declining uh, declining profitability. Company uh, uh, company S, uh, uh, it's, um, it's got reasonable liquidity, but it's actually in the net overdraft position that compounds the fact it's in the net debt position and that, that is relatively large and, and arguably getting increasingly so. Management, founders disinvested, outsiders running it, not, doesn't feel like there's strong alignment of management incentives here. Guys aren't personally invested. Um, and, and a ship can't sell itself. It needs a captain. And the macroeconomic factors, it's playing in the construction space. It's tough for even the big guys, the Murray and Roberts and the like. They are making losses, writing off contracts, struggling to fill order books. Even they are taking pain. Whereas, Company A, a uh, company P, um, it's profitable. High GP margins, highly competitive, improving profitability, improving trends of profitability. It's got a liquid balance sheet, net cash position. It could pay off its debt today. Well, at this reporting period, it could pay off its debt today, sitting in a net cash position. So it's got time. It can weather out the storm and turn around properly. Not just that, but its management, its founders holding the know-how and the RP. Um, are still invested, are buying more, and are still running on a day-to-day basis. Um, this, they, this ship, Company P's ship, has got a captain. And the macroeconomic factors is the telcos are undoubtedly spending. Defense is a very inelastic spend, so the defense market, uh, however opaque it is, it is still still spending. It will continue to do, uh, do so go, uh, globally, but more importantly, the telcos is healthily spending in South Africa, and a company P has an option to export, and they, they can. So um, I, th- I think we'd all agree it's obvious that company S is a value trap, and company P is actually offered true value if you bought it right at the beginning. So which companies are these? And I'm sure, because it was actually on the invite for t- today, company S is Sun Yati. Uh, they, unfortunately... Gone to liquidation, uh, things haven't turned out well there. Whereas the uh, company P is Pontings, and uh, Pontings has been a 10 bag if you got in at the right moment. Um, yet you saw how similar both of those share graphs looked. Um, if, you, if, if you didn't know, you didn't have the power of retrospect. So hindsight's always 2020 vision, but uh, and as useless as as looking at what's already happened is, I hope I gave you some tools that you can approach turnarounds uh, to find if there was a value versus value trap. Um, some tools you can look at. So let's let's summarize those tools. Have a look at profitability. It's really the aim of the business. Is it going up? How strong are those GP margins? Do they have operating efficiencies? And if not, can management cut out costs? Do they have that ability? Um, liquid, and more importantly, are, is the profitable trends, are they, are they actually improving? Is there a chance that they can? Uh, liquidity, cash is king. You, you, the more cash involved in a turnaround, the more cash on the balance sheet, the safer this is. The more the, more the company has the leisure to, to weather any sort of storm. Um, and that directly links into debt. The less debt, the better. Um, finally, Management management is very important, and you've got to look at uh, do they yeah 
are the are, are the rats jumping ship? Does management is management personally investing in the business? Are they actually buying script themselves? Um, so Nyati, all the way through the fall, I don't remember any of the directors ever buying script. That that was, I mean, that was now in hindsight, it's a very telltale sign, but I don't remember that happening. Um, and just have a look at the qualitative aspect of management. They're actually turning the ship around. Probably they're the most important variable. Yeah. Um, then don't forget the macroeconomic factors. Have a look at the industry. If even the big guys are struggling in this industry, how can some of the marginal players do it? But if this is a thriving industry, the odds are this is asset-specific risk within the company. And, in fact, it's a very, very healthy industry. And if they get it right, they can, they can enjoy the benefits of, of, of the industry growing and the like. So on a balance of probabilities, considering these fundamentals and arriving at a conclusion with a stock price offers value or the value trap, you want to arrive at a risk-adjusted decision. Because these, these, this example worked out relatively well where there were stark contrasts between the two. But often there isn't. Often a company will have a couple things working in their favor. Maybe they'll have good cash on the balance sheet, no, uh, no debt, and uh, management, you know, management is still the founding management. But they have, they're operating in a terrible industry, and they have low GP margins and, in fact, declining ratios. Often you won't get an obvious answer. But if you balance, if you, if you have a look at all those variables and on a, on a balance of probabilities, you arrive at a conclusion, you will have a much better chance of being correct than if you just looked at the share price and bought it because it fell. 